Jane is almost home. We're next off. We're next off. I wish I could express just how much fun Elijah and I had making that for this series. And yes, to answer the common question I've been getting, it took several tries to get that trash can shot. Uh, we're in the third week of this series called Urgent where we're walking through the Gospel of Mark, which just happens to be my favorite gospel because it's the one that I got to take a whole semester class in with Shane Wood, one of the professors at OCC. And Shane was really able to make this book come to life for me. So I really like the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to go through chapter 3 today, but I do think that it's valuable to kind of run up to this point in the narrative. I think we have been really building up to something here. Well, we start out with this huge statement that Dan covered in week 1. The beginning of the good news, the gospel, about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Huge statement, which I'll reiterate in a minute. And then we see this guy, John the Baptist. He comes up. He's preparing the way for Jesus to start his ministry. Jesus calls his first couple of disciples. And then he has his first encounter with an evil spirit. And these evil spirits are all over the first few chapters in Mark. And they just keep doing weird stuff. Like this one says, Ah, I know who you are, the most holy one of God. Right? He's an awful complimentary little demon. Uh, but Jesus just says, Hey, shush it. And that's odd, maybe. Uh, and Jesus starts healing a bunch of people. And now Jesus' popularity is quickly spreading. Right, he's starting to gain the attention of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and this is when you see the four controversies that Dan brought up last week. And the Pharisees start to challenge Jesus for several reasons, right? He's super popular. He's claiming to be the Messiah. They have seen this script play out before. In the years before Jesus, there were actually dozens of people who claimed to be the Messiah. They usually led violent revolts against Rome or whoever was in power at the time, and they always ended poorly for the Jews. So yes, the Pharisees needed to kind of check this guy out. And now the last controversy from last week runs right up into the start of chapter 3. The beginning of chapter 3 uh, is, is the second half of Dan's last controversy that he brought up last week. So I won't belabor the first part of the story again. But it is significant that Jesus brings up David in the midst of that argument with the Pharisees. And David is considered the greatest king of Israel, and Jesus here is aligning himself with David. He is likening himself to David. So what has been happening all throughout the, the book of Mark to this point, and for the rest of it, what we're going to see uh, even more clearly fleshed out in chapter 3 is Jesus is establishing his kingdom. And a lot of people don't like that. Shane's definition of conflict in his class was when two people or two kingdoms try to occupy the same space at the same time, there's going to be conflict. And really, uh, the, the tension is between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdoms of the world, and we tend to slip back and forth between the two as people from time to time. Uh, now, Jesus won this fight with the Pharisees because they aren't willing to say that David did anything wrong. This is a story from the Old Testament. You can read it if you want. David is on the run for his life. He's being pursued by King Saul. He's going to be killed, and he runs into the temple. It actually wasn't the temple yet. It was still a tent. They hadn't built the temple yet, but he goes into the holy place where he was not allowed to go. And the priest asks, uh, what are you doing here? And then David lies, and he says, uh, we're sent on a mission from the king, but uh, my men need food and rest, so how about we just take the holy bread, the consecrated bread? Uh, he was not allowed to eat that. It had been symbolically sacrificed to God. These were highly important rituals. The Jews took these rituals and these symbols incredibly seriously, yet when teaching this story in history class, the Pharisees never would have accused David of any wrongdoing. Why? 
because he was a hero in their story, so they didn't like to accuse him anyway. But also I think maybe there was a point in time when the religious leaders understood what Jesus is trying to tell them right now. And he actually makes it even more clear in the very next story. So let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Can I pause for just a second and try to recognize how this probably felt for this guy? The man with the shriveled hand is probably really scared to stand up. This has to feel super shameful. Why do you want me to stand up? So everyone can continue to point out what is wrong with me? So they can look at my arm and claim that this is a curse from God because that is how he would have been treated by the Pharisees and all of the other Jews for his entire life. Oh, you have a shriveled hand. You realize that's because of a sin either earlier from your life or maybe from your parents' lives. So God is ashamed of you, and God has cursed you. Now, I don't think what Jesus is about to do for this man socially is any small feat. And I guarantee you that as he is standing up, he is trembling, just waiting for the insult from yet another teacher. But instead, it goes on to say, Jesus then asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. All right, so, okay, they jump all the way to murder there. That seems like kind of an unfair escalation, but I, I do want to take a step back and try to understand the Pharisees a bit. All right, you see, they were correctly interpreting their current situation of being enslaved to Rome as a judgment from God. Right, you see, it all over and over in the Old Testament, Israel strays away from God. They start worshiping other gods or doing some form of evil. So they end up being taken over by uh, some foreign nation. Eventually, Israel repents. They cry out to God, oh, I'm sorry. And God eventually sends them a Savior, a Messiah, who leads them out of oppression and back into their glorified state. So the Old Testament ends with Israel returning out of an exile back to their home. And what we don't see in the Bible is that they are actually taken over four more times by four separate kingdoms before Jesus. In the 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the birth of Jesus, they pretty much spend the entire time under the control of someone else. Now, just a short time before Jesus, the Romans give the Jews back their religious freedom so they can practice their rituals. So the Pharisees are a group of religious elites that are born out of this time period. And their sole purpose was to protect the law, protect their religion, so that God can see that Israel has returned to obedience. Every time in their history that Israel again started following God, God saved them. The Pharisees were trying to restore the nation of Israel back to obedience because the nation of Israel was out of control. It's not that they were obsessed with laws. They were trying to get Israel back to a posture of obedience. So maybe, maybe God will see their obedience and move them out of their current exile. So I want us to understand the Pharisees' frame of mind so that we can more easily realize that we actually identify with them an awful lot. They are the bad guys in these stories, but they, they weren't evil. They didn't have evil intentions. They actually had very good intentions. They were just starting to miss the point. That is what Jesus is trying to educate them on. In Jesus' kingdom, relationships are more important than rituals. Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to save or to kill? This should be a no-brainer, but it isn't. Because for so long, they had been so focused on the laws, on the rituals, that they were missing the point of those very rituals. I had a whole bunch of examples listed to to illustrate how sometimes we align by accident with the Pharisees, but honestly, I don't have enough time. But we all owe it to ourselves to ask ourselves honestly this question. Are relationships with people outside of the kingdom of God more important to me than my religious rituals? 
All right, you can say that a lot of different ways. Relationships are more important than being right. Or pursuing loving relationships that show people the holiness of God is more important than perfect church attendance. It doesn't mean that rightness and gathering in church aren't important. They absolutely are. But those things' purpose is to foster relationships between each other and with God. That's really all the Pharisees lost sight of. We can't break the Sabbath. We need God to see that we are obedient. Really? At the cost of someone's life? Or we see the importance of relationships in Jesus' kingdom here again in just a minute after he has another weird encounter with some demons. Uh, so we start to see more and more crowds following Jesus from, from farther away as Jesus' popularity is clearly beginning to grow. Then in verse 11 it says, Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. So again, these evil spirits are complimenting Jesus, exalting him, giving him the honor that he is due. This doesn't exactly seem like a demon type of thing to do. Uh, a couple of things are going on here. First of all, they're fully aware of who Jesus is. And we see this all the time in scripture. Once people come face to face with God and are in full awareness of his presence and his power, it forces a physical response. Usually people just fall over. But while the titles they are giving Jesus are accurate, I also think they are a little bit strategic. All right, where have we already heard this title, Son of God, given in the book of Mark? Mark 1.1, 1, 1, right? Right out, of, right out of the gate, the beginning of the good news, the gospel about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark wants to make it exceedingly clear from the get-go of his book that, that Jesus is here to establish his kingdom. Why is that clear just from that very first sentence? The title, Son of God, was given to one person and one person only in the entire Roman Empire. That was the emperor. Right? That was his title or one of his titles. And the first use of, of this title for the emperor, as far as I'm aware, uh, was the Priene community, a group of Romans, uh, who wanted to bestow an honor upon Augustus. Uh, so, so they wrote this long explanation for why they thought the entire calendar should be reoriented around Augustus's birthday, which was like September 23rd or something, I think, uh, ultimately ending with the thought that he is, after all, the son of God. All right, they lay the flattery on pretty thick, I think is kind of entertaining. So let me just read you the inscription from the praying calendar from uh, 9 BC. It says, since providence, notice the capital P, since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things, bring about peace. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our own ex uh, expectations, Right, they're saying he's super attractive, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of the good news, the gospel for the world that came by reason of him, etc., etc., on and on it goes. My point is this, nobody in Jesus' time would have been confused about what he is doing which is, again, establishing his kingdom from the claims that he makes about himself to his actions, the thing that he's doing, down to the titles that demons are giving him. There is no question about what he is here to do. The first time Jesus encountered evil spirits in Mark, they call him the most holy one of God. Now, based on the people who were in the crowd at the time, mostly Jews, they would have heard Messiah in that statement. He was going to tr trigger some people, right? That was going to make some people mad. This time they call him the son of God. Based on the people in the crowd, a lot more Gentiles, non-Jews, they would have heard the term emperor in the title son of God. That is going to cause some problems for Jesus socially. All right, there's actually only one crime that can receive the punishment of being crucified on a cross in Rome. That is high treason, insurrection, trying to overthrow the Roman kingdom. Jesus is here to establish a kingdom. Everyone would be seeing that clearly. What they didn't understand 
was that Jesus wasn't trying to establish an earthly kingdom. He's, he, he's o- trying to overthrow the kingdom of Satan. He actually didn't set out to destroy Rome. The disciples have a hard time understanding this for a long time, but Jesus is about to make it clear later in this chapter that his kingdom is not restricted by geographical borders. It doesn't matter, it didn't matter who is in power because Jesus established an everlasting kingdom that is not restricted by our imaginary lines. That was true then, it is still true now. As, as far as the advancement of the kingdom of heaven is concerned, it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is or what nations are in power. If we truly believe what the Bible says, we are a part of an eternal kingdom and the gates of hell will not ever prevail against it. And then Jesus calls the rest of his disciples. In verse 13, it says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. I love how Peter, who's telling these stories that Mark is writing down, just had to throw in that shot at Judas. He clearly had like some unresolved feelings there. But Jesus shows us something really key here by calling these people and sending them out. He's sending them out to preach, to do exactly what he is doing. He is giving them the authority to establish his kingdom. And the emphasis on all of this demonic activity is really to just illustrate the point that if Jesus really is trying to establish his kingdom, where the kingdom of Satan is already reigning, his kingdom is going to be assaulted. There will be attempts to push back against that, but Jesus gives his disciples the same tasks and the same authority that he himself has. It is interesting to me that that he does this so early in their time together, and it's not as if we have to wait years and years before we're allowed to become useful to the kingdom. Just a thought. Uh, Jesus, in, in this calling, is telling us that his kingdom grows through unity and discipleship. And discipleship is kind of a buzzword in Christianity, but really all it is is an intentional relationship. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or magical. It's just two people coming together to help each other grow in any ways that they can. And the awesome thing is that that can start immediately. It's not like you have to sit in a hundred church services and attend three classes before you're allowed to disciple and be discipled. You don't have to have the authority to, to grow or you don't have the authority to grow the kingdom of heaven for at least three years after you met Jesus. That's ridiculous. You want to know how simple this can be? About two years ago, uh, I, I asked Tom Nutt if he'd be willing to do this for me. He's a man I really look up to in this church, and I thought, you know, it really wouldn't hurt if I was a lot more like Tom. Uh, you know what we do? We don't do Bible studies. Uh, we've had lunch. He asked me regularly how he can pray for me. Uh, I know he is a person that I can confide in when I'm having a difficult time. He's helped me with some projects. Uh, he's invited me to come work with him. He let me just sit on his tractor one time while he was moving stuff around. And I, I know that uh, I actually slow him down when I'm helping him work. Uh, but that's all it has to be. And that's what works for the two of us. And this is how he's helping me be more effective. And there's a certain handful of teenagers that I spend quite a bit of time with outside of our usual church activities, and it looks a little different for each kid based on their interests, but it's not rocket science. Uh, Tom does this for me, I do this for some of our students, and this is how the kingdom grows. Quick side note, I do have a group right now that is really good at being useful. Uh, They aren't really just sitting around waiting for their turn to do things. One of the things that my group as a whole, I think, is pretty good about is getting out and doing work for people who can't. Uh, So if you have projects and things that you need help with, maybe around the house, outside, whatever, uh, call me. And I can't promise that, uh, that we will do it, that we will be able to do it, but I can promise that if they can, they will. And we always have a ton of fun doing it, but the kingdom also grows through unity, Okay, buried in this list, easy to miss, are two names. Simon the Zealot, meaning he was a violent political revolutionary. 
Uh, That's what zealots were. Let me read you just some research about zealots from Jesus' time. The zealots were an aggressive political party whose concern for the national and religious life of the Jewish people led them to despise even Jews who sought peace and reconciliation with the Roman authorities. This was a group in complete opposition to Roman imperialism and anyone connected to it. Extremists among the zealots turned to terrorism and assassination and became known as Sicarii or dagger men. They frequented public places with hidden daggers to strike down persons friendly to Rome. Matthew, the tax collector, would be defined as a person who is friendly to Rome. He profited, became extremely wealthy, actually, by stealing money from his own people while taking their taxes for Rome. Jesus' kingdom doesn't play by our rules. We spend so much time and so much energy trying to say that uh, Jesus would be Republican or Jesus would be Democrat, etc. But Jesus honestly doesn't care. He has his own kingdom. And to try to fit Jesus into our American political boxes betrays where our first loyalty lies. Did you hear me on that? If Jesus were here today instead of 2,000 years ago, instead of a tax collector and a zealot, I feel like maybe he would have possibly had someone participating in racial protests from last year and someone that attended all of the Trump rallies in his group and forced them to realize that they actually both only have to shift their focus just a little bit, have to shift their lens just a little bit to see his kingdom. Jesus says, I care deeply about the things that both of you care about, but I see it through the lens of heaven. An interesting thing happens after spending time with Jesus. The zealot and the tax collector start to get along. Can you even imagine that happening today? If not, maybe our focus isn't on the right kingdom. I mean, I wonder if if Matthew ever wondered if Simon was still walking around carrying a dagger. I wonder how long it took until the hate turned to simply mistrust, then maybe even acceptance and eventually friendship. Jesus' kingdom grows through unity and discipleship. Verse 20, Jesus then entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Uh, This family is probably not Mary, his mom, and his brothers, because they are specifically mentioned in just a couple of verses. So there's probably an extended family that comes in and says, hey, he's crazy, don't listen to him. Why would Jesus' family from the region be trying to get control of that situation? Well, if Jesus is mounting an incredible popularity and is starting to look like a political upheaval is about to take place, remember, son of God, emperor, they might be a little bit afraid for their lives. Attacking Jesus specifically isn't the only way for Rome to get him to stop. And the Pharisees are also mad at Jesus. What if his family had been kicked out of the synagogue? What if the Pharisees are consistently making their lives difficult? It may be that, that they're trying to really say, hey, Jesus, stop causing problems for our family. Mary and the brothers are mentioned just a few verses down, so I'm going to skip ahead and take all of the family talk all at once. It says, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in the circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is an incredibly shameful thing to say. There would be no greater shame for a family in this time, in this culture, than the disowning of a family. But what Jesus is really getting at here is that my kingdom is not constrained by the sociological values that occur, that occur in your societies. My kingdom is not concerned with what society finds valuable. My kingdom is not even concerned with what society finds honorable. My kingdom is concerned with who has faith in me. Jesus' kingdom defines your identity. What I mean by that is this. Once you take that plunge... Once you get baptized and put your faith in Jesus, I don't care what used to define you. 
I don't care if you were rich or poor. I don't care if you were a part of this family, that family, my family. I don't care if you were a Republican or a Democrat. I don't care if you were American or Chinese. I don't care if uh, what sins used to define your life. I don't care if you were a jerk, a drunk, or a stripper. I don't care if you were gay or trans. I don't care if you were a murderer. I don't care if you were a liar or a thief, popular, weird, athletic, nerdy, old, young. You are a part of my family now, and I love you. So let's finish this thing up, starting in verse 22. Jesus continues, he says, uh, And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is casting out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. He can then plunder the strong man's house. Then we see the religious leaders that came down from Jerusalem. Did you see that? Right? They brought in the big dogs, like the ones that hang out around the temple, not just your average country church youth minister playing preacher for the day. I've lost complete control of the situation, so now Dan is showing up. Right? They say, no, he isn't crazy. He's just possessed by Satan, right? by Beelzebul, which means Lord of the house, which actually isn't a term that the Jews like to use. They felt it gave Satan too much honor. It gives him authority over a home where they like to say that Yahweh has authority. So they uh, had actually come up with their own term, a way to reference Satan without giving him honor by actually mocking him. Uh, most likely they would have actually said Beelzebub, uh, which means Lord of the Flies. Have you ever read the book? Uh, flies really referring to the dung that the flies like to hover around. So Beelzebub, Lord of that pile of poop right over there. Uh, And Jesus is like, okay, so what you're saying, Pharisees, is, let, let me get this right. Satan is casting out Satan. That Satan is taking pot shots against himself. That's your best argument. Okay. And, and he's saying, As he is saying, a house divided cannot stand. Can't you just imagine him looking over at his family? Then in verse 27, Jesus explains what he's doing. I am binding up Satan so that I can begin to rob him of all of the possessions in his home. My ministry's purpose is to destroy the kingdom of Satan. Jesus' kingdom will destroy the kingdom of Satan. I know it's easy to look outside and think that Satan still has control over this place. But he has been bound up. He does not have the free reign that he once did on the earth. The ministry of Jesus that continues to this day through the church has radically restricted his power. I know crappy stuff is still happening, but I mean, like, Paul was bound up and in prison, and he still wrote half of the New Testament letters. So yes, there is still power there, but he is restricted. The church is able to work in the world because Jesus has bound Satan. He has tied his hands up, restricted his power by dying on the cross and making people... uh, being resurrected. Satan's number one weapon that he used against us, killing people, making people fear him through death. Now we are saying that when he tries to use that, his greatest weapon, that it actually advances our kingdom. We no longer have to fear death. Oh death, where is your sting? Jesus has robbed us from Satan's possession and now we have been charged to do the same. Not in a couple of years from now after we learn some more, but right now we have the authority to preach, to cast out demons, to expand the kingdom of heaven every single place we ever set our feet the only question that we have to face is which kingdom will i choose Uh, will you guys pray with me god i'm so grateful for uh all the people who are who are watching online today and uh lord i just ask that as we as we move throughout our week that um that you can give us the, the courage to take your kingdom and advance it everywhere we go. That we can take it to 
the ends of the earth to our workplace, to our schools. Uh, Lord, I just ask that uh, as we continue to move through the book of Mark, that we, can, that we can see the way that you move, the way that you establish your kingdom here on earth. And we love you so much. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you for joining us this week. Have a great week.